Hey kids, and welcome to the Like Stars Podcast. I'm your host, Pete Goodman. So grateful that you're deciding to tune in to this episode. Uh, it's going to be a good one. I can't prove that. I'm just going to say it anyway. Uh, but I'm excited because uh, you recording this at the beginning of a whole new year, 2023. Uh, it's raining and cloudy and cold in Southern California. I guess that's the apocalypse, but I got my uh, Mr. Rogers sweater on and I'm ready to talk about some fun theological things. Again, fun. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Today, uh, I got some good questions, a, a big topic that's been asked a ton of times uh, by a number of different people. I'm finally going to just try to address it. The question of predestination. Does God decide things in advance? We're going to dive into that. I also have uh, a very special I don't know what you want to call it. A uh, little, little extra gift for you, I guess, if you're listening today. Uh, somebody asked me about the music on this podcast. And so stay tuned to the end of this episode. And, uh, you may or may not like how I end it, but we'll see, but it's going to be a little bit different. And, uh, so yeah, you can also just skip this whole thing and scrub to the end now, but I wouldn't do that because there might be some really, uh, important life changing things that I'm going to say over the next few minutes. Probably not, but whatever. Anyway, so uh, as always, as we continue to dive into the year, thank you everybody so much for listening, for sharing, and for liking, all that kind of stuff. Please continue to do so. It helps so much when you hit that little smash the like button, as John tells me to say. Uh, it really does help, especially if you're sharing it, if you're commenting, all these different things. I love to hear from you guys. Thank you so much for those of you that are putting questions on social media, Instagram, the Like Stairs podcast, Like Stars on Facebook. Like stars on YouTube, uh, like stars, uh, bobblehead toys are coming out. That's not true, but thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. It's, uh, it really does help every little bit. Um, and if you're listening on the podcast, make sure you're subscribed to it, uh, and you're setting up, consider maybe leaving a review or something, uh, unless you're not going to leave five stars. If you're one of those people that's going to like, well, it's okay. I'll leave. No, no. If you're not gonna leave five stars, then don't please don't leave a review. Just go crawl back in your cave and keep it to yourself. But if you want to leave five stars, you could be like stars. That was dumb. All right. Uh, and here we go. Over the past couple of months, honestly, since I first started the podcast and it started with a, a Q and a session we did here at rise city church. And when we took all the questions that came in, I kind of grouped some of them together into topics. And there were a number of one that fell under this one topic. And then as I started taking questions from more people, um, similar question kind of kept coming in. And it was all around this idea, a big word, predestination. And some people asked it in the, in the realm of like Calvinism. Uh, does God know in advance what is going on? And that's really the question at the heart of predestination. People want to know. Does God decide in advance who's going to heaven and who's going to hell, or do humans choose it? And this is actually an area of incredible tension and disagreement among the Western church. You have a large group of people who uh, are often labeled by a person who sort of had a thought a long time ago named John Calvin, and they're called Calvinists. There's a lot of things Calvinists believe, but one area that sort of stands out is often this, this concept of or this focus on the idea of predestination, that God decides in advance that everyone who's going to be saved and go to heaven has already been determined. God already knows who it is. God knows that you'll be saved before your life and whatever. It's really not up to you. He chose you or he didn't choose you. And then you have other people on the other side that say, that doesn't seem right. Uh, and oftentimes they're labeled as Arminians, which comes back from a whole theological debate about four or five years ago. Arminians say, no, I, I think God knows in advance who's going to say yes, but we still have the free will to choose. So it's not pre-selection, it's pre-knowledge, and humans still have free will. So it really does kind of come down to this idea of free will um, and things like that. So predestination what should we think about it? What does it mean? How do we think through this? How do we rationalize this? And then what do I personally think? Uh, all right. And I'm going to dive in and give you my thoughts. As I've said on a number of other podcasts, and you'll I'll keep saying because it's important to me, there are things in Christianity that I would call essential core doctrines that form the foundation of who we are as followers of Jesus. And then there are things that are maybe outside of the periphery of that, that are a little bit less essential and how far away you get, I guess, depends on how close or not close you are to being essential or core. A lot of the things that we've talked about so far 
on this podcast have been more in the realm of non-essentials. I haven't spent a ton of time talking about things that are, you know, this is absolutely certain. Part of the reason for that is because the things that are a bit more certain, people often have less questions about. <laughs> it's usually the peripheral things that people are more like, wait, what about this stuff? Those are the things that we argue about a lot more. You'll find that the things that are really central and core to our faith aren't the things that we spend a lot of time debating and arguing. So predestination, Calvinism, the idea of God's forward knowledge versus forward determinant, all this kind of stuff does not fall in the realm of core essential Christian doctrines. It's on the outside of it. Uh, so I'm going to give you some thoughts. I'm going to give you some perspectives and then I'm going to give you my opinion. But if you disagree with me, if you're not with me, it's okay. We're not, we're not talking about you know, that you have to believe this to be a Christian. And in many ways, the church is very divided over this. If it was a clear, obvious thing in the Bible, we wouldn't be so divided about it. So I'm going to try not to make it sound like I think it's clear and obvious, but I'm going to give you my opinion when I believe about it. So again, if you disagree with me, totally cool. This is kind of an open-handed issue. So let's get into it. Where does this idea of predestination even come from? Well, essentially, there is a Greek word that appears a few times in the Bible. Uh, it's translated sometimes as destined or um, in, in the book of Acts and in 1 Corinthians, there's this idea of destined or planned. Uh, and then, but really there are two passages where the apostle Paul writes and uses this big Greek word. Uh, there's Ephesians one, and it's used twice in Ephesians one. And then in Romans eight, it's also used a couple times. And in both places, uh, this Greek word proarizo or proarizen, Paul uses it. It's also used again in Acts and in First Corinthians. And proarizo or proarizen means something that's translated as predestined, also sometimes as foreordained. Both of those are really huge words that nobody outside of Christianity or deep theological arguments ever uses. What would a word like that mean in normal people English, right? Uh, it would probably mean just, uh, there's probably not one single English word, but it just means kind of decided in advance. It made a decision beforehand. That's what priorizo means. I, I decided beforehand. At the core of conversations about predestination, deciding in advance, priorizo, all these kind of deals, Romans 1, or Romans 8, Ephesians 1, is ultimately the question of, Here's another big word for you, God's sovereignty. If you ever heard people say the sovereignty of God, God's sovereignty is a big theological issue, question, debate, but it's really not that difficult. A sovereign is a king or a ruler. The word sovereignty just means in charge. A, to, to be sovereign means that what you say goes. You, you do what you want, basically. A king is sovereign. Nobody tells a king what to do. And so, in this issue of predestination, free will, no free will, we often talk about God's sovereignty. And it's like the extent. It's almost like to what extent every Christian that I know, hopefully, believes that God is sovereign. He's God. He's king. He can do. We all acknowledge that God can do whatever he wants. So it's not an argument about whether or not God is sovereign. It's an argument about how much does God use his sovereignty when it comes to my personal life. Uh, we all know he can do whatever he wants. Got it, right? Everyone on both sides of this argument believes God can do whatever he wants. The question about God's sovereignty is, does he? Does he sort of overstep and actually do things without my permission or without me thinking, or without me choosing? Do I even have any free will at all? Or has he sovereignly decided all of it? And that's really where people come down. And people who are in this, maybe, uh, and it's 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 a big catch-all sort of, but often referred to as Calvinists. And again, Calvinists believe a lot of things. This is just one of them, but maybe it's what they're most famous for in some ways. Calvinism highlights God's sovereignty to a very high level and says uh, everything that happens is preordained. God decides it as king. He, he mandates it and everything works out exactly the way that God wants it. It's kind of the, the, the way you really would push God's sovereignty. And this comes down to you and I, are we saved and going to heaven because we made a decision or a choice? Or is it because God in his sovereignty as king decreed, you will, you will, not you, not you. And the ones he says, not you to, sorry, you're out of luck. The ones he said yes to, great, yay me. Um, that's an oversimplification, I know. 
And then on the other hand, you have these people who are often called Arminians. It's another way of saying it. That they want to say, well, man, I don't, it seems like when I read the Bible, there's a lot of places that talk about me choosing and deciding. <laughs> I have decided to follow Jesus. Can I even sing that song in a Calvinist church? Um, and so I, I, they want to hold on to this idea of there's got to be free will here. There's got to be choice or decision on my part. If I didn't choose any of this, I, I'm just a robot. I'm an automaton. And these two groups have argued back and forth. And philosophers on both sides have made very good arguments, have really gone at it and tried to whatever. Now, let me kind of walk through as best that I can some of the biblical places where this comes up and, and how we can think through it. First, if you are this, maybe a person who identifies as an Arminian who says, no, no, free will, there's a problem. And the problem is, how do you escape the fact that there are passages that say God predestined? And one of the ways that Arminians often try to do this is by sort of reimagining or rethinking what that word means. And sometimes I'll hear people say, well, it's not that God predetermines, it's that God pre-knows, foreknowledge. So it's pre, pre-knowledge, pre not predestination. Like we believe that God knows who's going to be saved. God, before time began, knew everything because he's God, but he still let us decide. That's kind of one way of working through it. Here's the problem with that. There is a word in Greek for pre-know or foreknowledge. It's prognose, uh, where we get our word prognosticator, predictor. Prognose means to know something in advance. And there are places in the Bible where prognose is used about God. Like he knows, he knew, he planned, he foreknew this was going to happen. So because there is a word for knowing in advance— you have to look at this and say, well, Paul used that word and knew what it meant. So if Paul wanted to just say, it's just foreknowledge, it's just God knowing things, he could have used that word. And sometimes he did use that word right next to predestined. He used both of them. He says, God foreknew it and predestined it. So you can't really make a good argument that what Paul is actually saying here is just that God uh, knew it in advance. When Paul uses pro-arizo or pro reason, he's saying something about a decision being made. Let me give you an example. When my son, Kellen, was born, as soon as he was, the doctor came in with the, with the, you know, the birth certificate, all this kind of stuff, what's his name? We said, Kellen James Goodman is his name. We didn't just make that up on the spot. My wife and I had preordained that name for him before he was born. We had talked about it for months and came to the conclusion that that is what we were going to We decided in advance that we were going to name him Kellen, and when he was born, Kellen it was. We didn't just foreknow it, like, oh, I know in my head. It's, no, we decided. It was a choice. I determined something. That is pro rezo. I've determined. I've planned something. I have intention before it happens, and then when it works out, see, I meant to do that. And one of the places that you see this, actually, I'll just, you know, I know many of you're listening, but I'll just read a verse for you. In the book of Acts, Paul is, I'm sorry, Peter is talking about um, just like the story of Jesus and everything happened. And in chapter four, he says this, and I'm just going to read it here. It says, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, talking to God, whom you anointed, you planned and called for him to be the king. Verse 28 says this, they did what your power and will had pro reason decided beforehand should happen. So they don't, uh, modern English translations don't use the word predestined there. They say decided beforehand, but it's the same word, pro reason. Decided beforehand. Paul is saying you made a decision, God, beforehand that Jesus would actually be turned over and suffer and die on a cross. Like, God predetermined that outcome. And that is what pro arizo, pro reason means. A decision made beforehand. God had a plan and he wanted things to happen a certain way. And they did. It's clear in the scriptures that God both knows things and decides things. Both of those things are true. When Arminian people say, well, it's all about God knowing things. Well, he does know things. I believe that. I mean, the entire Old Testament prophesied the coming Messiah, right? God does know things in advance. But 
it also, from the scriptures, we see that he also decides things in advance. I would argue, and I'm giving some of my opinion, but I, I think I'm on pretty strong ground here. I think it's inescapable to read the scriptures and not come away with the conclusion that God in his sovereignty decides things in advance before they happen. Like he has plans and intentions that he wants to have happen and he makes them happen. God is completely sovereign and God does what he wants, sometimes predetermining what is going to happen. To me, that's just the scriptures. That's just the Bible. I don't think you can escape it. God predetermines. So obviously, if I'm saying all of that, I must be a Calvinist, right? All right, I'm a good, I need to like grow a beard, read the ESV Bible and start drinking micro brews. Um, I don't know what that was a stereotype, sorry. Uh, no, no, I'm an Arminian. I'm gonna be a hippie who doesn't love the Bible. And it's all, it's all nonsense. No, no. Am I a Calvinist because I believe that God predetermines things? Well, no, I'm not actually. Uh, I'm not a Calvinist. But here's what's maybe an important thing for you to know about both me and this argument. That doesn't make me an Arminian. It's, it's, this whole thing is like, we've made it very black and white. You're either this or you're this. You're either a Calvinist and you believe God predetermines things, or you're an Arminian and you believe, no, he doesn't predetermine things. He only foreknows things. I actually think at the core that I think both of those things are kind of right and kind of wrong. And I'm neither of them. I don't label myself a Calvinist or an Arminian. Uh, I actually look at this issue and say, I kind of feel like both sides are missing the point. And as a, as a biblical scholar, but also just a follower of Jesus, I think there's a third way to understand this concept of predestination that doesn't really make me a Calvinist or necessarily an Arminian, maybe closer to Arminian, but I'll explain that. So here's why I want to talk about this and, and what I want to say, how I want to walk through this. I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not an Arminian. How can I not be out of those things? Aren't those the only two options? No. And here's why. For me, the issue or the question at hand is not whether God is sovereign. He absolutely is. God can do whatever he wants. He's God. He has complete power. He has complete wisdom and knowledge over all things. He can do anything he wants to do. He is not accountable to anyone. He's not accountable to me. He's not accountable to you. He does whatever he wants. He is God. I believe that. It's also, in my opinion, not a question of whether God predetermines things. It's not a question of whether God in his sovereign power makes decisions in advance and follows through on them. I believe that he does. But before you call me a Calvinist, the issue that I have with Calvinism is not a belief in God's sovereignty and not a belief in predestination. The question is not, does God predestine? The question is, what does God predestine? The question is not, is God sovereign? And in his sovereignty, does he not do things he wants to do? No, no, he does. The question is, what does he want to do? And that's the rub. That's the issue. I think the problem, going back to the 1700s and 1600s, you had these two groups of people that later became Calvinists and Arminians, whatever, arguing about whether God and his sovereignty predetermined whether people went to heaven and hell. And the whole word predestination became attached to an entire school of thought that said God predetermines who's in and who's out. God predetermines who's saved. And another group of people said, no, 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 God does not predetermine. He only foreknows we decide, right? And that was the argument. Does God decide who's saved and who's not saved. Notice there, the issue at hand is not whether God decides. The issue at hand is what does God decide? Does God decide salvation? Does God decide whether you actually become a Christian? That's the issue. Now, I want to look at another place, and I'm going to walk through some verses with you. Um, Paul uses a different, uh, he uses the same root of uh, pro rezo, but it's a slightly different. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul is writing the Corinthian church and kind of saying, you guys are really missing the point. He's really, he's kind of coming down on them and they're, they're really making a mess of things. And the whole book of first Corinthians is Paul being like, I need to help you. I need to correct you in some ways. 
And there's this moment when he's talking about the wisdom of God and how it's foolishness to the world, that what God was trying to do, that what God was about, his mission in Jesus didn't make sense. It didn't happen the way the world wanted. And in chapter two, verse seven, he says, we declare God's wisdom, God's wisdom, which is a theme of this entire podcast, the wisdom of God. And he said this, it's a mystery that has been hidden. Like we didn't understand it, that God pro reason destined for our glory before time began. God pre pro reason, he destined, he predetermined for our glory before time began. Now, I want you to notice something here. If you look at the whole context of 1 Corinthians, especially chapters 1, 2, and 3, at no point anywhere in that passage does Paul mention anything about you dying and going to heaven or going to hell. That's not what he's talking about. Actually, what he's talking about is what does it mean to live this life you now have in Jesus? He's coming against these people because he's saying, you've been given new life in Christ and you're you're not living it, you're wasting it. He says in chapter three, and I'm gonna read a verse, I'll just, he says this, you're still acting, and he uses the word worldly, you're acting like you used to. And he says, you're acting like mere humans. What is going on? Well, I want to I want to introduce you then to the rest of the predestination passages here. Paul says you were predestined or predetermined for something glorious beforehand, but you're acting mere human. You're acting worldly still. Meaning, in my opinion, what you were predestined for was to act more than human, to be more than worldly mere human. And let me show you where this makes sense. The two passages I said where you see predestination strongly are Ephesians 1 and Romans 8. So let's go to Ephesians 1. And uh, if you're listening in your car, please don't open your Bible and follow along with me. You will die in a car wreck. Just listen. Okay, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, Paul says, He, God, prorizo, predestined us, predestined, there it is. Okay, done. Can't escape it. The Bible is clear. We are predestined. Close the book. It's all over. It's done. Case closed. What else do you need? Hold on. <laughs> Please finish the sentence. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glory and grace. What you and I were predestined for, predetermined for, is not here in Ephesians going to heaven or hell. It's adoption to sonship. And if you remember, if you listen to a previous podcast going all the way back to the image of God stuff, we talked about how this idea of being a son of God is part of the image of God, being kings and queens. He predetermined, he planned in advance that you and I would be adopted into sonship through Jesus the Christ. And I think in 1 Corinthians, when Paul talks about you're still worldly, you're still mere humans, you're missing out on what you were destined to be, Ephesians 1 is telling us the plan, the destiny that you and I have is to become sons and daughters again of, of God through Christ. And then he continues a few verses later in verse 9. He said, he made known to us the mystery. There's the mystery again. It's a different letter, but it's the same. He made known to us the mystery of his will which he purposed in Christ. He showed us the plan to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment. It's all before time began, God had a plan. He was moving towards it. And what was that plan? Ephesians chapter one, verse 10, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So I know that's deep stuff. You're kind of, maybe you're like, what are you talking about? Let me break it down. Paul is not saying in Ephesians, God predetermined in advance who was going to be a Christian and who wasn't. Hell for you, heaven for you, hell for you. That's not what he, that's not the context of his, of his conversation. He's saying, when the world was good, Genesis 1, we were responsible to care for it and we broke it. And God had a plan. He 
a predetermined in advance plan to restore it and bring it back to its original glory, to bring unity to all things in heaven and earth that have now fallen out of unity because of how broken we are as God's image bearers. What is that determined plan? What was the plan for, what were the blueprints he drew up and said, this is, you know, like you think of like some, some people that are going to go rob a bank and they sit in some, you know, like, uh, they're getting together on a table with a light and they, they unroll a document and it's got all the, the different ways to get in the bank and they draw up a plan. This is how we're going to do it, boys. That's predestination. A predetermined way to bring about your results. God's predetermined way to bring about what he wanted was to us to be adopted through sonship through Jesus Christ. And you might be like, you know, that that's, that's heavy stuff. It, it's confusing. Well, here's the deal. I think it actually gets clearer when you read it in Romans. Romans says something very similar. In Romans 7, Paul is talking about the way that we're slaves to sin, we're broken, everything is ruined, woe is us, nothing is good. But wait, now in Jesus, we've been freed from the law of sin and death. We are now people who live by the Spirit, and living by the Spirit is a whole different way to live where we can actually become what we were always created to be because now the Spirit is doing it. And he says this great verse, he says, creation is waiting and groaning for the sons of of God, sonship to be revealed and to be liberated from its bondage for the human beings that were supposed to care for the earth to become what they're supposed to be. They're, all of creation is waiting for that to happen. And Paul in chapter eight said that was the plan. Romans eight twenty nine. those God foreknew in advance in his mind, he predestined, he pro arizo, not to go to heaven and hell, but look at this, to be conformed or transformed, metamorpho into the image of his son, image of God, what we're created for. That he, Jesus, might be the firstborn of many brothers and sisters, a whole people group. And those he predestined, the ones, he had this idea in his mind, this is what's gonna happen. He called them out. And when they said yes and responded, he justified them and made them right and then brought about glory, he glorified them. So what we're seeing here, I know this is deep stuff, but I hope you're following me. Predestination in the, in the words of Paul and the teachings of Paul has nothing to do with whether or not you and I are going to heaven or hell. That's a separate issue. What Paul is saying God predestined was his rescue operation. God's plan was to create a Christ-shaped people group, a renewed human race modeled around Jesus to become sons and daughters through Jesus, to be conformed to the image of the Son. That is what you and I are predestined for. Does God predetermine things? Absolutely. But it's not who's going to heaven and who isn't. It's how he's going to remake creation and restore all things, including us. He's revealing the plan. That's what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians. This mystery is now being revealed. The, the plan, the destiny that God had advanced is now being shown. How is he doing it? How would God ever fix this broken world? Well, it turns out he had a plan from the beginning. And that plan was he would become one of us and walk among us. And then call us to be transformed and changed into his image by becoming his disciples and being led by his spirit. And in doing so, all of creation can finally let go of its groaning and anger and things can be what they're supposed to be. And you know, we say, well, hold on, Pete, but Ephesians 1.11 doesn't say that. It just says predestined. In him, we were chosen having been predestined according to the plan. Well, that doesn't, how do you know that, Pete? Well, he says this, in order that we who are the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Paul is actually saying about himself. He's saying, I was chosen. I was called in order to talk to you about it. So here predestined is almost like being used to say God predestined Paul to be a part of his overall predestined plan. And Paul would say in Romans, I've been called, I've been set apart to be an apostle. And he's saying it here, but then he says, and you also are now included in Christ. We heard the message, meaning now you're a part of what I was predestined for. We're all in this together. His purpose for Paul was that he was predestined to fulfill a particular calling on his life. And he's saying that calling is to help you see and understand that we're all called to this. Um, and another verse, you know, I, and this is sometimes I hear this as well. well ho hold on, Pete. What about in chapter nine of Romans when Paul talks about God hardening Pharaoh's heart? Again, I think that's just adding to what I'm talking about. 
I believe that God predetermines things, that God in his sovereignty does what he wants, that he accomplishes his purposes. And sometimes that means how he, how people are involved in that plan. In Romans 9, Paul says that God hardens Pharaoh's heart, but it wasn't so Pharaoh would go to hell and Moses would go to heaven. It was because God had a purpose and a plan that ultimately was leading to Jesus and the redemption of the human race. And he will use any means necessary to bring about his plan. He accomplished his purposes. So in short, I would say in short, really what I'm saying is I think Calvinists and Arminians are kind of both off a bit because they're arguing about the wrong thing. They're arguing about whether um, God predestines us to go to heaven and hell. And I don't think that's what these passages are even about. God is absolutely sovereign. He can do anything he wants. There's no question. But what is it exactly that he wants? And what he wants, it's, it's not whether he predestines, it's what he predestines. I believe in predestination. But what I believe is that I have been predestined to be conformed in the image of the son. And that is how I will find the life I was called for. And that isn't a selective thing like just you, just you, just you. It's not how Paul is using the word. He's saying this is God's plan for creation. And anybody who wants to hear the call, the invitation to come and follow Jesus can come and follow Jesus and join in this plan and be justified and glorified through the blood of Jesus. All people are invited to join in to God's predetermined plan because what he predetermined was not individual people going in and individual people going out. He predetermined that the human race would hear a call to be transformed and changed by giving their faith and loyalty to Jesus the Christ and being remade through the power of his spirit. That is what we're predestined for. And I believe in that. Um, it's a plan God had from before the beginning of time. It's the plan that God had in his mind when Adam and Eve first sinned. It's the plan that God had in his mind the entire history of humanity if we continue to screw it up. And it's a plan that you're invited to join into. So at the end of the day, I, I think where we land on this is there's a middle ground. It's not an either or. Wisdom tells us that God is sovereign, that God pre does predetermine things that God is behind the scenes, that God is moving. He is preparing the ground. He is sometimes accomplishing his will through us. There is predestination, but that doesn't shut the door on your free will and your choice. It doesn't mean that faith and living faithfully isn't still something you have to decide to do. The decision to follow Jesus is a real decision. When he invited you to come and follow him, it was a decision, a choice you have to make. Will you make that decision? It's both. God is at play. God is moving. God is sovereign. But in his sovereignty, he's also given you the choice to join into his plan. Will you do it? Finding new life isn't all you. You don't do it. Like I, I, I am a follower of Jesus because God has paved the way, um, because God's spirit has drawn me and called me. But I still had to choose. I still had to say yes to it. To join in on the thing that God predetermined does require some choice. But it also means relying on his spirit and what he's doing and the activity he's playing. Now, a big part of this conversation is the word grace, right? Grace. Uh, so maybe next podcast, I'll talk about the word grace, but um, I'm already going really long, so I'll stop there. Uh, and yeah. Okay. I mentioned uh, that, that I had something special. Well, one of the questions I got, and I know I'm kind of long here, was <laughs> this is completely unrelated, completely changed, but um, somebody asked about the music that starts and ends this podcast, and they're like, "I the singing, is that you, Pete? And Yes, yes, it is. Um, that was a song I recorded a while ago when I was still cool. I was never cool. Um, but uh, I just decided to use it. By so some of, I had somebody ask, can I hear the whole song? And I said, oh, sure. So as sort of a special welcome to the new year, end of the podcast, uh, instead of just playing like, you know, a few seconds of this song, uh, I'm going to play the whole thing. So thanks so much for joining on this episode. As always, please, please, I would so love it if you would leave a comment, ask a question. Uh, if this was helpful to you or you have a friend, please share it with others. Um, and uh, man, I'm just so grateful. And I look forward to the next podcast. We'll talk about grace together. Uh, but in the meantime, here is uh, a song that I wrote a few years ago um, for you to enjoy. Take a listen and we'll see you next episode. Thanks again.
Don't 